So, um, my name is Peter Knapp, as you said, at um, University of York, and when I'm not standing up and talking about research, my day job is teaching undergraduate medical students in Hull York Medical School about research. So our uh, potential future leaders, and that's a real challenge. So I can see I've already got a more receptive audience than I'm faced with um, most Mondays. Um, oh, this, actually, yes, this time of year, they get very interested in me because of the exams. They have, they, they have to be examined in, they have to know about research methods, and, and the email traffic goes up dramatically in May. Uh, and, right, so I'm going to tell you about uh, a couple of uh, qualifications really to tell you about. One is that the project I think is really interesting but it's not specific to cancer so it's about um, children and adolescents and their involvement in any form of health research, that's the first thing. Second is this is a study that's just started so we started four months ago, it was funded last year. What I don't have to do is many results, what I have is ideas and plans and kind of uh, 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 objectives to talk about. I hope you, you'll find it really interesting. So, some background to this. So, we, we're called TRECA. Um, it stands for Trials Engagement in Children and Adolescents. Um, it's been funded by the uh, National Institute for Health Research, so NIHR, which is the research arm of the NHS, essentially. And the study aim is to improve the information that young patients and their families are given about a clinical trial. And some background here is I think, I think the situation is rather different in oncology uh, as it is in other clinical areas with children, but the situation is that few children, few children and adolescents are recruited into clinical trials. And here's a really striking statistic, really nice paper that Cohen and others published in 2010. What they did is they looked at nearly 200 medical journals 20 years before 2010 and then compared them with the the journals that have been published in 2010, and looked at the number of trials that have been published. What they found is there has been a huge increase in the publication of trials over 20 years. Since, since the late 80s to the early 2000s, the number of trials in adults had doubled in that time in, in the developed world, and the rate in children is about a sixth of that. So not only are there fewer trials in children, actually the rate of growth is significantly lower. And there are all sorts of reasons why that might be the case, but it just, you know, that there's a real dearth of clinical research in young people. And what we know is that many young people and their parents decline trials, and I do think that is often different in oncology, but um, in other areas where children will be asked to take part in trials such as diabetes, epilepsy, uh, asthma, skin conditions, actually the uptake rate is relatively low and there might be, what we don't know at the moment, it's a bit of research here and I'll probably some, I can give you the full references for the papers if you're interested. Um, is what we don't know really is whether the priorities that parents and children's children have when they're asked to participate in research, whether those are the same that adults have. And I think there's often a, an assumption that they're the same, uh, and we don't really know that. Why might you not take part in a piece of research? One of the problems, I think, is the way that we provide information. And the written information sheets, I think, are deeply flawed. So a lot of research around the way that adults can understand the information that we provide to them when we ask them to take part in clinical trials. And a suggestion that they're too long, they're too technical, they're uninviting. And Armstrong and others, so Mary Dixon Woods' group um, in the University of Leicester, Armstrong was the lead author on that paper, did a really nice critical sociological analysis of information sheets provided to parents um, and their conclusions were it's not clear what their function is. So research ethics committee would expect those information sheets to inform decisions, to allow a patient or a, uh, a parent or to, to make a decision about trial participation. What Dixon Woods and others say is that often they're trying to achieve too many things so that the sheets are there to sell the research to, to the participant or as a form of contract, this sort of, if you take part in this research, we have certain obligations to you and in return you have certain obligations to us. So there's a real mismatch of objectives in the information sheets that make them really problematic documents, I think. And here's some examples. So uh, I've got no beef with these researchers or what they're doing, but here's some kind of long, boring text, uh, quite rightly in there, because the research ethics committees would require that people know about these important issues. But I think these are things that are, off, that are presented in using quite difficult language and really uninviting uh, uh, presentation format. You don't only see this. Um, what you do see with trials increasingly is uh, uh, producing videos to uh, go alongside the, the, the written information sheet or a kind of 
piece of marketing that will, that will give you an introduction to the trial that goes as an accompaniment to the information sheet. But I think those don't quite hit the mark. So what we're trying to do, what, sorry, what we will do in Trekker is to develop two multimedia information resources. And what I mean by that is they're going to look like a website or an app, and they'll be viewable on a PC, on a tablet, on a phone. Um, one, and it's a really nice categorization that Faith uh, talked about from, the, from Nuffield Council. So the, the idea that one of the MMIs will focus on that second group, so children who can speak for themselves but are too young really to make a decision and one will focus on children who are able to make a decision but are not yet legally adult and their parents. So one, there will be some content, I think, that will overlap, but one will be much smaller, much um, uh, less sophisticated than the other one. And the idea is that these MMIs will be templates. So we'll develop something for each of them that um, contains generic content. So each of them will have things that will pertain to any trial, like what randomization is, the need for confidentiality, the need for follow-up, the right to withdraw. And then we'll recruit individual host trials who will slot in uh, information that's specific to their own trial. And I was involved in a previous project that was funded by the MRC that was hosted by the University of Manchester in which we did something similar looking at trials involving adults. It was called START. And here's the front page. As I, you know, I haven't got it live. And, it, and what we've done a similar model. We've developed something with generic information, trial-specific information that's slotted in, and then run, embedded it within host clinical trials to see what effect it, it has. And we, we, we've done that with six trials, and we're just drawing on the data at the moment. Um, but that's the front page of that. And then I was going to show you the, a bit of the animation from um, the Nuffield Council of Bioethics, but I think Many of you will be familiar with that or seen it before, and I know we're short of time, so I won't go in, into that. But I think it's a really nice, well, it's a brilliant animation. I'm not sure, we, we, our ambition within Trekker is to have some animation. I'm not sure we're going to manage this level of sophistication. Um, but it gives you, an, I think, a really nice uh, insight into the way that, well, one, you can produce animations that don't date. One of the sensitivities about producing something electronic, particularly for young people, is that they will laugh at stuff that looks like it was produced before they were born. And so having real people wearing real clothes, you know, and haircut, uh, you know, is, is, is problematic. So animations can help you to overcome that sort of sensitivity. And the other is, is about age appropriateness, and I think this video really um, handles that very well. Okay, so there's two study phases. Um, we're in the middle of the first phase at the moment, doing the development, and then we'll be testing the MMIs within clinical trials next year. So it's a project, it's a study that's two and a half years in length. Um, and we're using, in this development phase, what's called participatory de design. Essentially, that means involving the end users or representatives of the end users in the development of the thing you're doing. But this term participatory design really comes from the development of computer software. Um, and the way we're doing that within Trekker is to have um, some focus groups um, involving children, adolescents, parents, clinicians, researchers, to tell us what they would like to see in the MMI, and then work up a draft and go back to them again, saying, what do you think of this? What needs to change? What can stay the same? I'll put that on this slide here. Um, and then we'll do some user testing. And what user testing involves is putting an MMI in front of somebody, asking them to spend some time using it, and then asking them to find the answers to a series of factual questions. And the really important thing about user testing is that you're testing the device and not the person, although my experience of user testing is that people can get quite nervous about this. Um, user testing is small sample research. Sometimes it's called diagnostic testing. You're trying to identify problems. You're not generating p-values that allow you to test whether one thing is better than another. Um, you're wanting to find out whether people can't find information, therefore you have to change the way the navigation um, works on the MMI, the way it's structured, and if they can find it and can't understand it, then you have to change the way it's being explained. So user testing, um, you can user test almost anything, but it's incredibly informative in a, in a, a quite a small sample but intensive way. You can get really great data to help the development of um, the, of the MMI or the document or the restaurant menu or whatever it is you're testing. And then the second phase in, in 2017 will be testing the MMIs within six clinical trials using a method that's called embedded or nested trials. 
What that means is there'll be a host clinical trial, it may be a drug trial, it may be a trial of physiotherapy, it could be a psychological intervention in which they're randomizing young people to receive one drug or another or one form of physiotherapy or another. So there's already a host clinical trial going on and then there'll be an embedded trial of the recruitment materials. So within that, uh, either hospital sites or individuals, and, that, and it could be one of those two things, will be randomized to receive either the standard information that's being provided, that, mostly that will be written, printed information sheets, or they'll be allocated to receive the MMI plus the information sheets. And what we're interested in is the proportion of patients who decide to take part, so it's the recruitment rate, the proportion of people who stay on the trial, in other words, the retention rate, and then also the quality of decision making. This is the thing that is most important to me. I and mean, for me, to, for a child and their parents to make an informed decision not to pay, take part in a clinical trial is just as important, isn't it, as one that, in, in which they would make an informed decision um, to, 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 to join, join the trial. So we'd be asking questions such as, do they think they made the right choice? Did they make a choice that was based on really understanding what it was about? Um, are they certain that the, in, in what they've done? There are questionnaires that we're going to use to to measure that sort of quality of decision making. Uh, so I've told you there that the potential trial participants will receive either the standard information or the standard information plus the MMI that be randomly allocated. And what we're hoping for is a range of conditions. So we'll be doing these six nested clinical trials. I, I, my expectation is that there'll be at least one oncology trial, though we don't know yet. We haven't recruited these trials, but you'd imagine there'll be a trial in you know, cystic fibrosis, in dermatology, in asthma, diabetes and across a range of sites across the UK and different age groups. And there's a possibility of meta-analysis. What we would hope, though you have a great deal of variation in these trials, the outcome, well, the interventions essentially are the same and the outcomes are the same. The so meta-analysis is where you draw together the results from a number of clinical trials and process them statistically to get an overall answer. So that should allow us to, one, have more certainty in the, in, in, in the effectiveness of this, of this intervention, and also will allow us to accommodate quite small trials. In, in oncology, I'm sure you're aware that drug trials are often very small, and for us to run a, a trial of the MMI in those, you know, would, would probably not have certainty in itself. Allowing us to pool the results from six trials should give us um, uh, uh, more, more conclusive answers. I thank my co so I'm, I'm the lead researcher on this, my co-investigators from around the country, and we've been funded by um, NIHR Health Services and Delivery Research Program. And I'll be pleased to take your questions later on, I think. Um, that's the case. Thanks for listening tomorrow.